Well, thank you. It's fantastic to be here. I mean, how do I follow that? It's going to be a bit tricky. And normally, of course, when I introduce myself as a statistician at a party, that's a good way to end all conversations. So I'm going to rename myself data scientist for the evening, because that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm a data scientist now, you know. No longer a statistician, although I am really. Okay, so I'm going to talk about causal inference, which is... Um, particularly for me about making good decisions with data. I think one of the issues that we have at the moment is there's so much new observational data. I don't want to talk about Cambridge Analytica, but I mean, if we're looking at analysing data, are we doing the right things with it? And in fact, I thought I'd get a bit political. This is Ada Lovelace Day. After all, I'm going to talk about the gender pay gap. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at the gender pay gap. If you're thinking of a moving company or if you're, you don't yet have a job, looking for your first job later on in life, have a look at how much they pay women. It's kind of interesting. Um, and that particularly gives rise to um, a paradox in statistics called Simpson's paradox. I'm going to talk about that. And that's related to something called confounding, which occurs a lot in observational studies. So before I go any further, who's heard of Simpson's paradox here? Not many. Excellent. So hopefully this will be new to you. And I'm going to let you read that cartoon, the brilliant XKCD, for yourself. Um, so... I kind of became interested in the gender pay gap when they first said that they would report it for all large companies, particularly because I work at Imperial College, a very science-based kind of university, and I know for a fact that generally these kind of companies and universities in general pay their men much more than they do women, so I was kind of intrigued as to how it would look. I mean, I'm used to working in a male-dominated environment. I mean, I started a maths degree in kind of 1986, and then as I've kind of progressed through my career, there have been less and less women around, really. I spent a few years as the only female professor in the maths department at Imperial. Thankfully, I've now been joined by two other women professors, but that's in a staff of close to 50 professors in our department. So we're not doing particularly well, but better than we were when I was the only one. So I'm going to talk about the gender pay gap, and I'm not going to talk about Imperial. I'm going to talk about the University of Inequality. And in fact, this university has a better pay gap than Imperial College. So, <laughs> so read into that what you will. Um, <laughs> And here we go, let's have a look. In fact, remarkably, it has exactly the same number of employees as Imperial as well. Hi, what a coincidence. But all the other data is made up. So <laughs> I promise if there's anyone from Imperial here, I'm going to be in big trouble. Um, so we admit to our pay gap. So this is a company, have a look at the pay. So it, well, the pay in a second. But the size of the company is, it, well, and Imperial as well, male dominated generally. Um, and let's look at the mean hourly pay. So men, on average, are paid £26 an hour. So this is not imperial data now. And women are paid 22 This is the University of Inequality, right? Women are paid £22 an hour on average, giving a pay gap of 16%. Um, imperial's pay gap, if you're interested, is about 19% for the mean, not for the median. So let's have a look a bit deeper at that pay gap and how it kind of arises. This is something I'm really genuinely interested in. And if we have, this gives rise to something called, well, this is a good way of illustrating something called Simpson's paradox, which is a fantastic paradox in, in statistics. Now, I don't know how well you can read that, but you also, companies also have to publish the percentage in each quartile of their company. So the lowest 25%, the, numbers, the number of women in that particular group, and so on. And you can see, and in fact, these numbers are the same at Imperial. It's just the pay data that's different. And you'll see for the highest paid staff, they're predominantly men, right? So you have more men in the kind of top ranks of, of companies. So let's have a look at what the pay is within each of their pay bands to see if inequality exists there. So are the senior staff paid fairly or not in terms of their gender? And in fact, it turns out that they're not, that, that there's actual equality in all of these particular bands. So if you look at the pay gap for the lowest band of staff, the more junior staff, it actually favours women. And for every single other band, it also favours women. So women are paid more if you just look at the senior staff and so on. So that's kind of crazy, given that overall, there's this massive pay gap in, in favour of men. It's not so crazy, really, because, of course, we've got so many men being paid so much more that it drags their average up. 
but it means that you can get this kind of misreporting of aggregated statistics, and I'll come back to that kind of later on. Of course, this is still a massive issue. If you go and read a lot of the university websites about their pay gap, they will say, oh, well, of course, we're really very fair. It's just because we've got so many men in these high paid jobs. It's like, yeah, surely that's inequality as well, isn't it? I think what I want to see, what I want to see in my lifetime is actually these bars on the left hand side of the numbers of, of um, employees at each band actually being equal. Then we'll have a truly equal society. Even if I'm paid the same as a male professor, the fact that there are only three of us really doesn't give me much hope at the moment. <laughs> but anyway, enough politics. So what's actually happening here is something called confounding. It's where you have this kind of hidden variable that's causing a particular change in how the data is reported. So here's a few examples that I want you to kind of help me with. So do you know that if you have a box of matches, it happens with lighters as well, if you carry around boxes of matches or lighters, you know, you're much more likely to get lung cancer. So what, what's the hidden variable here? Smoking, absolutely. Here's one that's a bit trickier. You know that the bigger feet you have, I've got quite small feet, but the bigger feet you have are actually uh, better at reading. Yeah, someone's seen this before. Of course, babies tend not to read so well. But you can actually get these hidden variables that aren't necessarily so obvious. So this confounding is a massive problem in these observational studies. Oh, here's a good one. You know, the more chocolate you eat, you actually have a better chance of winning the Nobel Prize. This is an actual scientific study. Look at this. So here's the data. Here's the data that proves this. This is published. This has been published. OK, so here's Switzerland, top right. They eat huge amounts of chocolate. They also win loads of Nobel Prizes. It's kind of crazy. You know, th so this is clear evidence that we need to eat much more chocolate in order to... Uh, anyone, anyone have any idea what might be going on here? Wealth, yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Better education systems. But, so you have these hidden variables, which mean that all the time we come to these conclusions based on correlation, not causation. And here's the, the cartoon that I showed to all my first year undergraduates at Imperial. And I'll say no more about that. <laughs> so, of course, there is a solution to this. I'm going to have to nip through this quite quickly because my 10 minutes is going to be up. But there is a solution to this, and this is what happens in medicine, in that you randomise. And this is such a fantastic thing. If you design a randomised control trial, you don't have to worry about confounding because you've randomised over all your population. You can actually estimate your treatment effects. The problem is, of course, all these statistical tools in general are designed and they work well for randomised control trials. They don't work well necessarily for um, observational studies where we've just collected data because they, they study that correlation rather than it being about causation. So this mantra about correlation and causation, you know, correlation does not imply causation. So I work in causal inference methods. That's what keeps me awake at night. Um, do they actually work? Well, here we go. On the left is one of the most famous statistician, statisticians ever, Fisher. The reason I've put this picture up is because he's smoking here. He strongly believed that there was, not an, there was not a link between smoking and lung cancer. And in fact, we know that is not the case. And another very amazing statistician, um, Brad, um, Austin Bradford Hill, who actually worked with Turing, showed that um, he, he said, even if we can't design a randomised control trial, wouldn't that be great? So we can do a randomised control trial where we force everybody to smoke for 10 years and see if they die of cancer. Of course, we can't do that, right? But we, we still have to use our knowledge to make good decisions. I think it's really part of our, I guess, part of our jobs as scientists is to learn and develop things that are going to make a difference in lives, I think. Um, so we have some big dangers in these observational studies, mainly because of, well, selection bias, but also confounding, which means that our baseline characteristics can be different between our groups. <coughs> so is there any hope? Well, I work in, I work in transport studies. Who can, who can tell me what this is? Map of London, yeah? But in fact, what it is, it's a dot for every road traffic accident between 2001 and 2007. This is the data that keeps me awake at night. And again, if I had a pointer, I'm going to run and get, try, I'm going to try a pointer now. OK, so here we go. I live, where are we? I live kind of up here in Camden. I have to cycle down here every day for work. 
So I can now do this because I know this data like the back of my hand. I design my trips so that I can make use of where I'm much less likely to die and get run over by some. <laughs> but I think that is such, you know, we were talking about beauty and beauty being in the eye. Uh, this is one of the, and it's, uh, maybe I'm just morbid. This is one of the most beautiful pictures, I think, really. A dot for every road traffic accident. Now, this is the Strava heat map. Now, I kind of run and I love cycling. This is basically 2005, all the cycling that was going on in London. But I mean, more seriously, not only are these images, I think, beautiful, but we can actually use them to make good decisions. So I'm going to stop there to say, just to say I love data. I think data is fantastic. And I don't mind being called a statistician, but I'll go with data scientist as well. But I think it's a really exciting time. I mean, we've already seen the ma amazing use of all the data we're collecting, and we can use that to make some really good decisions. Um, but of course, we do have to be aware of the issues with reporting of data. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Emma McCoy.